I became a net worth millionaire at age 35. I'm a pretty average guy with pretty average investment knowledge, but I've put it to work. And I think that's the good news. In today's episode, what I want to do is share with you the three places you must be investing. Yes, all of you should be investing right now. And I'm going to give you specific details and then open the door wide for you to pick and choose from the sub-investments within these three, as you'll see. Once you understand the three places you should be investing your money and the order in which you should invest them, things will continue to snowball for you in the right direction. If you're not already a millionaire, you will be soon. And if you already are, your next million will come faster than imagined. So let's unpack the three places you should invest your money and in which order. Well, welcome back to The Graham Cochran Show, where each week I'm helping you uncover your uniqueness so you can create more money, margin, and meaning in your life. I'm your host, Graham Cochran. Pumped to hang out with you today. We're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is money. And it's important to understand money. I think it's really critical to get honest with ourselves. As Morgan Housel puts it, and I did my review of his book, The Psychology of Money, but he puts it beautifully, that there's two areas of life that all of us have to interact with whether we want to or not, and that is money and health. At some point, we're going to have little of each, and we better figure it out. So even if you're not a money person, even if you're not a numbers person, even if you think money is evil, you need it, and you're going to deal with it, and you already deal with it. So let's just not be weird, and let's figure it out. So that's part of what this show is been about and what we'll continue to unpack. And today we're talking about investing, and I'm going to share with you the three places you should invest and in what order. And we'll get specific as well. So let me just give it to you right off the bat, and then we're going to really unpack these. And my hope for you, depending on where you are in your investment journey, is that if you're brand new to investing, this will encourage you to see how easy it is and maybe help you think about investing a little bit differently. Uh, it's not the whole shove your money into something, hope and pray. That's not what I'm talking about. So if you're brand new, this will hopefully encourage you to get off the starting blocks and start your investment journey. If you are a veteran investor, my hope is that this will get you to think a little more broadly. Are there some areas where you haven't invested yet that you can diversify your investments? Or if you're already doing all three of these things well, let this be a day to encourage you because sometimes we can be doing things well but have no comparison to know whether we're on the right track or not, let me come in, not as an expert, not as a financial advisor, but as a multimillionaire who figured some things out and is continually learning about this stuff and doing what I preach, let me come alongside you and encourage you that you're already on the right track. So here it is real quick, and then let's break it down to get into the specifics. Three places you should invest, and I think this is true for everybody, is number one, in yourself. Number two, in your business, and we're speaking to business owners here, and if you don't have a business, you should start one, and number three, outside your business, and in that order. This is very, very important. You want to be investing in yourself, in your business, and then outside of your business, and in that order, I'm going to show you why from a return, risk, cost perspective, okay? So let's break it down. Invest in yourself first. What does that mean? Pretty obvious, but this is education, okay? The, the number one way you can create more wealth is to be able to add more value in the world. It's, it's just the most simple formula I can give you. People who make a ton of money and who end up with a ton of money have found a way to add a ton of value. The more value you make or create in the world for more people, the higher your income, right? Uh, in one of my favorite books, The Go-Giver by uh, John David Mann and Bob Berg, they wrote that book together. You should be reading that book. It's on my list this year to reread. I reread it almost every year. But in The Go-Giver, there's five laws of success. And there's the law of income, which says that your income is as relevant to or tied to the number of people you serve and how well you serve them. So if you want to have more money, you got to go serve more people and serve them really well. And what does serving mean? It means adding value. So if you have a product or service, it means serving more people with that product or service. If you're a consultant or a thought leader, it's getting valuable thoughts to more people that add value to their lives. You know, if you 
have the gift of helping other people make more money, well, that's valuable. If you have the gift of helping other people get healthier, that's valuable. If you have the gift of helping people improve their relationships, that's valuable. But how many people you help, and can I add more value to those existing people that I'm already helping, these are the the dials that you turn up to create more money for yourself because you're creating more value in the marketplace. Well, how do you do that? You do that by figuring out and putting value in yourself first. We don't come out of the womb with much to offer people. You'll discover that you actually have some innate intuition and gifts that were put there from by, by the Lord into you that you don't need education to have or to even be able to share. So that's that's there. So you don't come out with zero, but but it's the education and a few other things I'm about to share with you that unlock that and then add to that. So that's a huge reason why I'm doing the 52 book challenge, which if you haven't already seen that, go watch the video. I'll link to it below or in the show notes uh, or just YouTube it, the 52 book challenge. There's a big reason why I'm reading a book a week this year and I want you to do it too because the more I have inside of me, the more I have to give. So education is books. That's the simplest way to start. It's courses. Like last fall, I've consumed, I don't know, a, 20 plus hours of course material in in new areas, courses, communities. We learn in communities, coaching, hire coaches, please hire coaches for whatever you want to learn. It's the best money you'll ever spend because you get that one-on-one growth and uh, personal experience. Experiences. It's amazing what you can learn and what value you can receive so that you can give out just by having experiences. And I don't just mean education experiences. I mean traveling to other countries. I mean doing a new activity that you've never done before. You learn about yourself and you learn about people. You learn about the world. The more outside of your normal bubble you you get and you experience, that adds to the richness of who you are, which gives you more value to give. So experiences and then events. Go to conferences. Go to weekend retreats. Be a part of a group or mastermind that has in-person gatherings. Like All of these things are education. That is the number one investment. Here's why this is the number one investment you can make in the first place you should invest. Uh, Number one is the return. When you're looking at investments, you're usually looking at what is my return on investment, my ROI. If I put in $100, how much do I get back? A, do I get my $100 back or no or not? Or do I get more than my $100 back? So if I could put in $100 into an investment and get $150 back, that's great. That's a 50% return. I got my my original money and $50 more. If I put something in and get $100 back, well, it's 100% return. That's twice as good. The return on education, investing in yourself, is infinite. There's no, It's unquantifiable. So I'm going to say infinite because it could be zero if you don't do anything with it. I don't think that's you if you're listening to the show. You're, you're literally, what you're doing right now is your number one investment. You are investing in yourself right now just by listening to this podcast, okay? It's infinite. And the reason why it's infinite is because there's no limit to what you could do with that education. And not only that, you could have, there's no limit to what you could do with that education right now in this moment and season of your life. But then that information, that education, that experience, that knowledge will carry over your whole life to everything you end up doing or touching. What you learn at 20, 30, 40, 50 will carry over 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. That's amazing. Infinite return. When you're looking at investments, you not only want to look at the possible return, you want to look at the risk. Because just because something has a great return doesn't mean it's worth doing because if it's really, really high risk, odds can be in your favor. But if the, if the risk is too dangerous, like the idea of Russian roulette, right? The, the game of Russian roulette, the statistically, you're going to be fine. Statistically, the odds are in your favor that you won't kill yourself. But the risk is way too high if you do, right? It's, it's, you can't justify the odds. So the risk is really important to consider when you're looking at the return. So we start with the return infinite. Well, that sounds great. What's the risk? Zero. There's zero risk. You don't risk a single thing by learning. You can't lose. You risk nothing by learning. Now, you also want to look at cost, return, risk, and cost. Now, what is the cost of investing in yourself? It could be zero in terms of dollars, but it's always going to be your time. There's always a time cost. 
So you are trading your most valuable asset, your time, for education, no matter if it's reading a book that you got for free at the library or going to a conference or hiring a coach, then you're spending money and time. So there's always a cost, but there's zero risk and infinite return. That's a slam dunk investment. And here's a bonus. As a business owner, education costs are tax deductible, right? Last week, I had my own tax advisor, Amanda Hahn, on the show. And we talked about all the things you can write off as a business owner. This is why you need to have a business. If you're an employee, you don't have a business, you have hardly any write-offs. If you have a business, even if it's a little side business, even if it's not a legal entity yet, you're a sole proprietor in the eyes of the IRS here in America, you can start writing off business expenses, including education, because it's a way to further your ability to create a profit. It's incredible. So every book, every course you buy, every coach you hire, every conference you go to, you can write those off. What, what does that mean? Well, that means it's a tax-free investment, okay? If I spend $1,000 on a coach to improve my ability to make money in my business, well, that's a tax-deductible expense. If I'm in a 25% tax bracket, I don't pay taxes on that $1,000, which saves me 250 bucks. That's a 25% return on my money. Just like if I put that $1,000 in my 401k, I save the 25%. If I invest it in education, I save 25%. Same return. Same tax-free benefit, and then I get the infinite return of the education. This is why this is you cannot beat this investment. And I can't under, overstate this enough. This is literally the best investment you'll ever make. And most people skip past this. So please don't skip past this, or you might be doing it without realizing it. So if you're, you are investing in education, you should be encouraged. You should actually think about, if I can plow more money and time into education, that's only going to help me because it's an infinite return, zero risk, minimal cost, and it's tax deductible if you're a business owner. Bam. Can't beat that investment. So that's the first and best place you should invest because it's going to increase your ability to earn. Number two is your business. It's amazing to me how many business owners want to learn how to invest money in other assets, which we'll talk about in a second, and other businesses and stock market and all that kind of stuff but they don't spend a whole lot of attention or creativity in their own business. And your own business is the one and only business you actually can control and influence its ability to generate more profit. I can buy, I own thousands of companies through the stock market. I have no influence on their ability to earn a profit unless I go buy a lot of their stuff <laughs> as a customer. But my own business, I have a 100% influence. I can't control all the other things, but I can control. I am the CEO. I am the employees. I, I am the guy. You are the girl. You can do this. So your business is the next place you should invest. Before anybody else's business, you should invest in your own business. And here's what this looks like. There's two areas that you're investing in your business. Number one is expenses, and number two are employees, right? So as an expense, this is any tool your business needs. Uh, physical or digital, including software, right? You use Kajabi, that's an expense. That's an investment in your business. It's a, it's, it costs money, but it allows you to make money, right? Equipment, this camera I'm talking to, this microphone, this lighting setup, my mixer, right? That all costs money, but like the desk, this chair, this, this, this office space, right? Any of those things are business expenses. They are investments. Now, you can get carried away and buy lots of stuff that you don't need, but if it helps you with your business or helps you grow your business, that's a smart investment. Number two is employees. Whether they are a full-time W-2 employee here in America or a part-time 1099 contractor, like I hire someone to design a logo or edit my, my Instagram reels or check my email or do customer service or even consult in the business, those are part-time. It doesn't matter. If, if they help you, by growing your income, they actually do something that grows your income. They sell for you. They manage a community in a way that grows your income. They write sales copy. They consult for you to help you grow your business. If they grow your income or they help you buy back your time, it's, it's a good investment. Because your time, in theory, if you understand time blocking well, is worth a lot of money. You and I have generally $10 tasks that we do in our business, $100 tasks that we do in our business, $1,000 tasks that we do in our business, 
and $10,000 tasks. And what I mean is per hour. So when I'm running a package to the post office, that's a $10 an hour task, right? When I'm copying and pasting uh, an episode of my podcast into my blog, that's a $10 an hour task. That's something my, my daughters can do for me for $10 an hour. I, I, should, I should be eliminating as many $10 an hour tasks, $100 an hour tasks, maybe even $1,000 an hour tasks, if I, if, unless I love doing them, um, so that I can spend my time to do the, what are the $10,000 an hour tasks? One hour of thinking can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're thinking strategically. Anytime I spend money on an employee or team member to buy back my time so that I can reinvest that time into $10,000 an hour tasks, that is a great investment. Okay, so this makes sense, right? Expenses and employees, the two E's. So education is the third, but I split it, split it up, right? Because that's not necessarily in your business. You could apply that by hiring a coach or consultant, but I, I lumped that in yourself. So really the three E's of investment in your business are your education, your expenses, or your employees. But the return, what is the possible return on investing in your business? Wide range. My estimations is 20% on the low end, 20% a year, which is amazing. Very few investments are giving you 20% returns, ROI. 20% up to 10,000% or more. You, you invest in some tools and some software and some team members. You invest in some coaching in your business. You apply all of that and you 10X your business. I mean, dude, that's amazing. That's the story of, of my, my business, right? I remember my first uh, six-figure year. I was doing $10,000 a month in the recording revolution. This was, go, this was the end of year two going into year three. It took me a couple of years to finally hit that $10,000 a month mark consistently. So I had $120,000 a year. That was amazing. That was 2012. Six years later, 2018 was when I hit my first seven-figure year. I did $1.2 million that year. So it took me six years to 10X my business. That's slow for some people who are just crushing it. Um, that's fast for me uh, because I was getting 3% raises at my old job. <laughs> um, so 10Xing my business sounds great, right? So um, 10Xing it in six years is amazing. And that's because I'm investing in myself and investing in expenses and I'm investing in employees and that way I'm doing more $10,000 an hour tasks. And then you get momentum alongside of that. Bam. It's a huge opportunity for returns. In, you could almost say infinite returns, but on the low end, 20%. On the high end, maybe 10,000%, which is insane when you say that out loud. What's the risk, though? There is risk in investing in your business, right? You hire somebody, it may not work out. You invest in that tool, it may not make more money for you. Um, you invest in a, a Facebook ad agency and you're out the, the money not only for them and for the ad spend and it didn't grow your business. There is a risk, right? But the risk is low. And the reason the risk is low is because you have control of the investment, your business. Not all aspects of it, but like we said earlier, you have complete control of this business. I don't, I don't have control of Apple, even though I own Apple stock through index funds that I own, which we'll get into in a minute, but I don't have any control over how well Apple does. Uh, my daughters, when they turn 10, I teach them about investing and we open up a, a brokerage account for them where it's a joint account where I, I it's like for, for kids basically where I kind of own it, but it's in their name and my name. And I teach them, I let them buy one stock, even though I don't invest in single stocks, it's a great way to teach them. And so side note, if you haven't taught your, your 10 year old or older, it's a, it's a great age to teach them. And what I did is I, I said, Hey, I want to teach you about investing. You can actually own pieces of companies. So if there's a company that you love, that you you spend money at, that you think other people spend money at, and you think will be worth more in the future, um, and you think it'd be fun to be an owner of, what would that company be? I remember four years ago, my oldest was turning 10. Uh, no, coming up on five years ago, she was turning 10. And she was like, man, I see all these Marvel movies crushing it. I see the Star Wars movies. I see uh, Disney crushing it. And, you know, they have theme parks and they've got the cruises. We've been on a Disney cruise before. She's like, I want to own Disney. And uh, it was a great lesson because what I said is I'll match whatever you save up in your chore money to buy a stock. I want to teach them about matching as well. So 
uh, one share of Disney stock at the time was like $140 or something like that. So she had 70 bucks and I matched it with 70 bucks and we bought one share of Disney stock. Turns out that was a bad investment <laughs> because that was the beginning of the end for Disney. It's only been downhill from there. Um, I think they'll come back eventually, but they are, they are in a mess right now. They got a little political and, uh, and the stock has struggled and they've made some bad products. They made some good products too. There's some good parts about the business that are sound. I think the theme parks are doing well. I think the cruise line is doing well. I think their entertainment, you know, part of the, the business is not doing so hot. Um, and so we, they were coming off of a high. So we bought it a high and that's, it's been up and down, up and down. And it's not doing great, but it's a great way to teach them that look, you can do some research. You can go with your gut. At the end of the day, I have no control over what Disney does. And Chloe, you don't either. She's like, yeah, lesson learned. So your own business though, you have 100% stock ownership if you're the 100% owner. You can control the value of the company by how you grow the company. So even though there's a risk, you're spending money that you may never get back. I have spent money on team members and tools and gear that I'll never make that money back. But you know what? I learned something. So there's a hidden phantom benefit there. But there is a risk. You got to know that. But it's low because you control the business. Okay? I love that. What is the cost? It's what you want it to be and what you can afford. Right? We, it costs money to invest in expenses and employees. But it's whatever you can afford. You're going to get great returns. If you have an extra $1,000 a month in your business and you can put it back in your business, you're going to get 20% or more returns on that money. And it's tax deductible as well because it's an expense in your business, whether it's an employee or a tool or a software or coaching, again, it's an expense. So you're getting an immediate, you know, if you're in a high tax bracket like myself, I'm in functionally a 40% tax bracket, which is ridiculous. For every $100 I make, the government wants $40 off the top for nothing, right? So here you go. Um, and I don't mind paying some taxes, but almost half of what I make, does it doesn't make any sense. So I, there, we're incentivized as business owners to create more wealth and and create more jobs. So they give you tax deductions on investments in your business that help you grow your business. So every $100 I can put into my business saves me $40 that I would be paying in taxes. So it's an immediate, for me, 40% return. So I'm getting a 40% return on every $1,000 I put in my business. And I get the return of the business growing, the 20 to 10,000%. It is virtually impossible to beat that. So, so incredible. So again, if you have a business, don't just go out and spend a lot of money to, to save on your taxes. That's not the point of this. But if you are strategically investing in your business in a way that you think will grow your income or buy back your time so that you can do more $10,000 an hour tasks, well, then you have a really high rate of potential return and you get an immediate tax break, which is an immediate return on your money because you're not having to pay those taxes, just like if you shoved all that money into 401k or retirement account. Make sense? All right, third and final place you should invest. You should invest in yourself. You invest in your business in that order. And then finally, you invest outside of your business. So let me give you the three core areas you can invest in outside of your business. This will be somewhat 30,000 foot view. So don't scream at me if I don't, you know, if you're a bit, you know, you're a Bitcoin bro, you're a crypto bro. And I don't, I don't talk about Bitcoin or crypto because I don't really view it as an investment. I view it as a commodity that you could own and it's only worth more. Someone else is willing to pay you more. Don't scream at me. You can still do that if you want to do that. But I'm not going to cover everything, but I'm going to cover some of the big ones, right? The big three. Hey, friend, we'll get back to the episode in just a moment. Real quick, I hope you're enjoying the episode. And if so, please share it with somebody that needs to hear this episode today. It would mean so much to me. Also, I want to give you a gift for hanging out with me today. I want to give you my free million-dollar life-giving business formula on-demand training. Inside of this less than 60 minute training, it will help you uncover your uniqueness to build a seven figure boutique brand without burning out. This is some of my favorite material. These are the things that I'm taking my private clients through, but I want to share them with you in this free training. So if you've already built your business, but it's not giving you life, it's taking life from you, this is the training for you. It's absolutely free. Just go to grahamcochran.com slash life giving. That's grahamcochran.com slash lifegiving, all one word, and you can register for your spot right there. Now back to the episode. Number one is other businesses. And, and think about this. You're a business owner. You realize that business is the fastest path to wealth, like having control of your income and the ability to create more income because you're creating value in the world. As an employee, you can only create but so much value because you're only creating value for your boss, or your team members, or your company. But as a business owner, you can create value for the whole world, which means you have unlimited potential, income potential. 
I love business. So I love other people's businesses. Not all of them. I think some of the businesses out there are shady or poorly run or are doing more harm to the world and people than than others. But on the whole, I think business as a concept, entrepreneurship and capitalism is a really good thing. It's what's created wealth and opportunity. So I can invest in other businesses. And if you never thought about that, that's what the stock market is. The stock market is the easiest way to own bits and pieces of other companies. Why just own your company when you could own other companies? And here's the risk I see. There's so many business owners, and I've coached some of them, who are like, I don't want to invest in the stock market or other businesses. I want to invest in me. I want to bet on myself. Well, that's great. I just told you to bet on yourself. It's the second place you should, I mean, really, one and two are all about you, you and your business. Those are the first and primary places you should invest. But you should never stop there because that is just foolishness to think that your business will stand the test of time. I hope it does. I want you to be in this game long enough. But that is taking a very naive stance that your business will be around for 40 plus years. Why not diversify and not only own and run your business, but own other people's businesses as well? This is smart. So the stock market is the the fastest and easiest way to invest in other businesses. And people who are afraid of investing in the stock market don't understand that it's not a piece of paper that you own. It is a slice of a company. And companies aren't going anywhere. Now, I will say the reason why I don't invest in individual stocks is because you could put a lot of money into a company and that company could disappear. What I invest in is in the stock market as a whole. I use index funds. My favorite is the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund because this one basket of companies takes every single company on the U.S. stock market that's publicly traded, what is it, 2,000, 3,000 companies? And if I put in $10,000, it splits it evenly among all 3,000 of those companies. So now I own everything. I own a little bit of everything. The reason why this works is because you don't know if Pepsi or Coke is going to win. You don't know if Apple or Samsung is going to win. You don't know if Tesla or Rivian is going to win. Like some of those companies will die, but they'll be replaced in the index with something else. And some of those companies will do well. It's like your grandma used to say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Now I own thousands of baskets. So if some of those baskets drop and the eggs break, I've still got tons of other baskets. And what I'm doing is betting on the U.S. economy, that the U.S. economy is made up of real people creating real value in the world, just like you and me. And it's going to grow because it has grown and it'll always grow. And if it doesn't grow and if it goes down, 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 like consistently, then we have a, a massive problem with the country and no real investment is safe. So it makes no sense to be pessimistic about the stock market. The stock market only goes up and only will ever go up in the end. It's up and down every day. That's why I never look at the stock market daily. It's, it's, it's the best analogy I've ever heard with the stock market is the stock market is a little boy walking up the stairs playing with a yo-yo, right? The yo-yo goes up and down. The stock market is the yo-yo. Every day, up and down, up and down. Read the news. It's like, it's great. It's bad. It's great. It's bad. You're missing the point. Don't put your eye on the yo-yo. Realize that the yo-yo is in the hand of the boy who's going up the stairs 10 years from now. He's going to be way higher on the stairs no matter what the yo-yo is doing on a given day. It's going to be up. It's going to be down. But if you understand that the market is predicated on capitalism, which is predicated on adding value in the marketplace, bad companies will die. Better companies will take their place. Bad ideas will die. Newer ideas will be replaced. Old technologies will die. New technologies will be repl- replace them. And so if you own the market, you're riding the stairs. You're riding the S, one of the escalators to wealth, as David Bach calls it. The stock market is one of the great escalators to wealth. You don't have to be smart to win. You just get on the escalator, stay on the ride, and you'll have more money in the future. So index funds are a great way to do it. I don't buy individual stocks because I... Who knows what the future holds? It's just way too risky for me. If you want to do some of that, it's fine, but just know that it's more like playing at a casino. Like you could make a lot of money, you could lose a lot of money. It's just it's not really investing to me. Uh, private equity, another opportunity to buy other businesses. So the stock market is publicly traded companies. Well, there's private companies, and there's a, there's people who do their research in certain sectors, and if you trust their acumen in a certain area, like I understand you know, financial companies, or I understand technology companies, or I understand manufacturing companies or oil and gas companies, they create their own funds, which is just like a mutual fund. 
where they raise money to go buy companies that they're going to flip. It's just like flipping a house. They're like raising money like, hey, Graham, I need a $10 million to go buy 10 houses in Tampa that I, I'm going to flip that I think I could make better. Will you invest in my fund? I, okay, yeah, I'll give you a million dollars of the 10 you want. And so then now I'm trusting them to go buy these houses or these companies, flip them to make more money. And then when they sell them or they get some more income from them because they flipped them, now they can pay me my million back plus a return. It's a little riskier in that you, you're you betting on fewer companies and you're betting on people trying to make smart decisions and smart people make dumb decisions sometimes, not because they're dumb, but because they can't predict the future. But you can get higher returns, much higher returns than you can in the publicly traded sector. So private equity. So those are other businesses. Why not own other businesses outside of your own? Real estate, right? One of the greatest things you can invest in because it's a hard asset. It provides utility, whereas a stock doesn't really provide utility. You're just owning a, a slice of a company. But if you own real estate, you own the land, the, the house or the property can be used for generating income and it can be improved, which increases the value. So there's kind of three ways to make money off of real estate. So this can be owning a rental property, a single family home or an apartment that you rent out to people. This could be short-term rentals like Airbnb. Uh, this can be just raw land. You buy land like there's people north of Tampa that have owned land for the last 20 years. And as you see the city growing up and getting further, further away from the city core as more people want to live here, well, people that own land that was a bunch of ranches years ago, they're selling off parts of it to build more neighborhoods and shopping centers. And they're making bank because they bought land and they held onto it for years. Uh, syndicated real estate. This is a great opportunity to invest in a, somewhat of a fund with people who are professional real estate investors. Again, they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes to buy big apartment complexes. And it's very much like private equity, but it's with real estate. Um, you put your money in, you get your return, and you can get really great returns, which we'll talk about in a second. Or REITs, real estate investment trusts. These are like a, an index fund or a mutual fund for real estate um, that are more accessible to the general public if you're not a, um, an investor that would qualify for syndicated real estate. So other businesses, real estate, and then there's alternative investments. This is a junk drawer term, but think about oil and gas. Like if you buy oil companies or like oil fields or gas companies um, or funds that that invest their money in oil and gas. Uh, private lending. Uh, we, we invested with a, a home builder here in Tampa. Um, they were building a, a beach house, and so they were raising money. So I lent money for them to build the beach house and got a really good return. And within 12 to 18 months, I got my money back plus my return. And I was just basically lending them money. So you can do private lending. Uh, or there's other kinds of alternative investments. I have a friend who has a fund um, that's based on mortgages where they go out and they buy maybe delinquent mortgages from banks that want to get rid of them. Uh, but these are people that just had a, fell on a hard time and they buy up these mortgages. And so then they're servicing the mortgage um, and they get people to get back on track with the mortgages and they're paying them. And so they, they're taking the income from those mortgages and paying that as a return to the investors in the fund. And it's like steady, predictable, like not volatile income, but it's, it's just, it's a bunch of mortgages. It's fascinating. So there's all kinds of alternative investments. You can fill in the blank with your favorite as well for something specific art, you know, other things as well. What are the returns? Usually on the low end, the average of the U.S. stock market for about 70 plus years has been 10% on average. That's not every day or every year, but that is if you put money in through the ups and downs, especially if you're continuing to invest in it, you would have seen an average return of 10% on the low end, um, up to 30%. Some of these private equity deals, you can get 30% 30, uh, 30 on your money, which is amazing. Risk, I would say medium. It depends. It could be really, really high. I say I would say medium. You don't have control of these investments unless it's your own real estate. You own the property yourself. And there's no guarantee that it'll go up. Um, but the reason I think the risk is medium is that if you have enough cash on hand, this is what we call margin of safety. Like you've got a ton of cash so that like if it's gone down, you can hold on long enough to recover any potential losses. There might be some investments where it goes to zero and it's gone. It just, it'll never come back. But if you're investing in other companies, real estate especially, um, and some of these alternative investments, even when your investment goes down, he who can stay in the game long enough can wait for it to recover. I remember specifically, we had a rental property and we bought it in 20, 2009. 
the real estate market was still collapsing from the 2008 crisis. And so I thought I bought it at a good deal because it was down from its high, but I didn't realize it had more room to grow, to go down. And so um, it got to 2012 and it had just dropped and I had lost uh, about, tw- tw- it's lost about 20% of the value. So it's like, I put 20% down on this property and that whole down payment was gone. It had dropped 20% of its value. Um, I had neighbors selling their properties. They're like, I'm getting out, I'm getting out. It's going down too low. And I, I said, why are you selling your property? Like, this is the absolute worst time to sell it. Like it's, it's down. You're literally locking in your loss. Just hold on to it. It will come back. Real estate always comes back, right? Because as you, there's not enough places for people to live and there's only but so much land. So it will come back. We're, this is a reactionary thing. But if you needed the money and you had no margin of safety, then maybe you had to sell it. We had cash on hand. We, we had renters in it. We're like, look, it's lost value on paper, but it's still worth something because people still need a place to live. Even when real estate plummets in value, renters still need a place to live. So I still have people in there paying me every month to live there. So I was like, I'm going to just hold on to it. Even if I'm breaking even on the rent, even if I've lost value, if I can just keep a renter in there, hold on to it, it'll come back. Well, sure enough, five, six years later, uh, I was able to sell it for double what I paid for it. So not only did the 20% come back, it then increased by 100%. I sold it for double. So I made so much just because I had the ability to hold on to it. Does that make sense? So that's why I feel like some people would say, oh, that's risky. The risk is high. I would say the risk is medium if you have cash on hand. What is the cost? Again, it's part of your business profit. So it's whatever you can afford. I like to think invest something every month in yourself, in your business, and in outside of your business. So you're really banking on all three. Even if it's just a few hundred bucks, invest in something outside of your business. Uh, and then tax benefits, there's some. It just depends on what you're what you're buying, how you're buying it. Um, it's not as clear as investing in your business or yourself to grow your business, but there are tax benefits. So just learn what those are and see, uh, talk to your tax advisor or CPA and see, you know, the investment has to make sense on its own, but then if there are tax benefits to be had as well, then how can we maximize those as well? I don't want to invest in something just for the tax benefit. I want to invest it into it for the investment itself. I feel good about the possible return and the risk and the cost associated with it, but I also want to maximize all my uh, tax benefits that I can get. If that makes sense. There it is. Invest in yourself, invest in your business, and invest outside of your business. And the final thing I'll just say here is, like I said earlier, don't be like most people that bet on just one or two of those. Invest in all three. Invest in all three. The smartest of us can't figure it out. In the last five to 10 years, and all the stat in front of me, 85% of active mutual fund managers, meaning the best and brightest, the highest educated people that are studying companies in the stock market every single day for a living, getting paid a lot of money to do it and putting together their funds that they think will, will beat the stock market. 85% of them can't beat what the stock market is doing. Meaning if you just invested in the whole stock market in an index fund, you'd be 85% of the smartest minds in our country who are trying to figure this out. They, what does this tell me? It just tells me that it doesn't matter how smart you are, we can't predict the future. The future is unpredictable. So it's because the future is unpredictable that you always want to invest in multiple different things. I, I, I believe 100% in the U.S. economy, even if we have recessions, because we've always had recessions, we've always had wars, we've always had terrorism, we've always had things, and the market continues to grow. It comes back. So I believe in it. I believe in my business. I believe in my ability to learn and earn. I believe in real estate. Even when it's gone up and down, I believe in it long term. But it doesn't mean any of it's guaranteed. So I'm not going to pick one thing and bank on it hard. That's, to me, that's, that takes a lot of ego and pride. I think it takes a lot more humility to admit, I don't know the future. So I'm going to spread my investments around into things I think will win. Instead of betting, betting on one horse in the race, I'm going to own all the horses. So I'm going to win. I might not make as much as if I bet on one horse and get lucky that he's the winner, but I'm going to win. And I want to win every single time. So that's how I think about it. So if you're watching on YouTube, leave me a comment. Let me know what was your biggest aha moment. Where do you need to think about investing next that you haven't maybe invested at all or haven't invested as much as you want? And where do you feel like you're investing well? 
Like, where are you growing? Where are you seeing the highest return? What are you pleased with, with your investment strategy? Feel free to share below. I hope this is helpful. Let me know if you like these episodes. We'll do more deep dives into money and all things business and money. But thanks for tuning in. It's always a pleasure. It's always fun to talk about ways to increase our wealth because at the end of the day, if we're not multiplying what God's given us, we're kind of wasting it. And whether you need the money or not, somebody does. So you might as well use your God-given gift to create wealth, which is what all entrepreneurs have, and make as much of it as you can so you can have the resources to do as much good as you can. It's it's a win-win. You never lose in that scenario. So thanks for hanging out. Have a great week. We'll see you on another episode. We'll see you.